Good afternoon. Uh, I hope uh, everyone had a good lunch and got a little, uh, a little bit of relaxation. We've got a, a really amazing afternoon planned for you. Um, just realized I'm on the wrong day. Um, so uh, we are going to um, start the afternoon with a conversation about um, Hannah Arendt and race. Um, Hannah Arendt was a, a, a Jewish, white, uh, German uh, thinker. Uh, we can have a debate between Lewis and I whether she was a philosopher or not. Um, she didn't think she was. But uh, she was arrested in 1933, uh, fled Germany, worked for Jewish organizations in, in Paris, and then made her way as a stateless person in the United States, and um, wrote a book called The Origins of Totalitarianism, uh, the first 100 pages of which are on anti-Semitism. And she, as I talked a little bit about this morning, for those of you who are here, really did uh, spend a lot of time uh, thinking about what anti-Semitism was and thought it was a form of racism and different from Jew hatred, as I was saying earlier. And then she comes to the United States and she's confronted with another form of racism, anti-black racism. And um, she doesn't say much about it in the first couple of years she's here, but eventually begins trying to write about it. And in many ways, she tries to import some of what she says, I think, about anti-Semitism as racism to the American context of anti-black racism. And um, a lot of what she says gets herself into a lot of trouble. Um, she talks about race in a number of her essays, but none more uh, uh, controversially so than her essay, Reflections on Little Rock, uh, which is about the Little Rock, uh, the desegregation of the Little Rock and other schools, um, and where she basically comes out strongly in favor of um, getting rid of legalized segregation, but against um, forced desegregation, as, as she will put it. Um, and that is, uh, gets her into a, a whole host of debates and troubles. The essay is uh, originally not published, then originally published somewhere else in dissent, and um, has become one of the more controversial, probably the most controversial essay she wrote, except for Eichmann in Jerusalem. Uh, so um, we have today uh, two people who have um, done an enormous amount of work on the question of Hannah Arendt and race. Uh, I think it's an important issue. I think, as I tried to suggest earlier, I think there's a lot of things she says about race that are interesting and meaningful and important, but there's obviously a lot that um, she gets wrong and that are controversial and needs to be talked about. And I thought at a conference on uh, a Hunter and Center conference on racism and anti-Semitism, we should have, at least have a panel where we bring together some people who have really done some important and critical work about um, Hannah Arendt and her thinking about race. So um, first, um, Catherine Sophia Bell, uh, formerly Catherine T. Gines, uh, who wrote a book, uh, I think published about five years ago, Hannah Arendt and the Negro Question. Um, it's a very important book. It's really the, as far as I know, the first book that explicitly, uh, as a book-length treatment, looks at um, Hannah Arendt and the question of race. And um, so um, Catherine will, will lead us off. And then uh, Lewis Gordon, um, who's uh, been a colleague for a long time, uh, he published a book on Fanon in a series I edit uh, with Drusilla Cornell at Fordham University Press. He's recently published, uh, a, he publishes more books than I can count. He, I had to tell him to stop because I couldn't keep that in my head. But um, a book on Samuel Bach, the Holocaust artist, about art and the Holocaust. And a new book, Freedom, Justice, and Decolonization. Uh, and he has uh, been teaching, he's a philosophy professor, both of these folks are philosophy professors, right Catherine? Yeah. Yes. And I've uh, been teaching a number of courses on Hannah Arendt and race for many years as a philosophy uh, professor. So um, I'm going to let them 
each speak, and then uh, we'll have a conversation and bring you guys into it. So thank you very much. Catherine Bell. I mean, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I am, in addition to being a philosophy professor, I am a happily unmarried mother of four children, two of whom are freshmen in college this year and two of whom are in elementary school. So I would like to begin with an expression of gratitude to my mother who moved in with me last summer and assists with the caring and keeping of my children, especially when I'm traveling on occasions like this. Thanks also to Roger for inviting me to speak at this conference, to Tina for helping with the travel arrangements and hotel accommodations, and to everyone else who takes care of the logistics like advertising the events and making reservations and ordering meals, et cetera. Finally, I would like to thank uh, my co-panelist, Lewis, and of course, the audience members for showing up and being present with me for this time that we have together today. So a quick overview of my main arguments in the book, Hannah Arendt and the Negro Question. Um, I have about 10 or so minutes to speak, so in that short time, I'm just gonna do a quick overview of those main arguments. So the first three chapters of the book focus primarily on that short but exceedingly controversial essay, Reflections on Little Rock. Chapter one, the girl obviously was asked to be a hero, takes as its focal point Arendt's errors and assumptions about the photo that she asserts prompted her to write her reflections. I argue that Arendt wrongly frames the de desegregation crisis in public education as a Negro problem rather than as a white problem. And she assumes that black parents who allowed their children to integrate previously all white schools were motivated by the prospects of upward social mobility, like the parvenu. Arendt does not consider the possibility that these parents who were exercising their legally gained rights to equal education opportunity for their children could be rebelling against their outsider status, like the conscious pariah. In chapter two, the most outrageous law of southern states, which makes mar mixed marriage a criminal offense, explores the close relationship between segregation laws and education and mixed marriage laws. I argue that the case that Arendt makes against miscegenation laws is also applicable to the discrimination laws in education that she defends. Chapter three, the three realms of human life, the political, the social, and the private, examines how Arendt's three categories are operating in the Little Rock essay and in the human condition. Contra Elizabeth Young Bruhel, I argue that Arendt's theoretical framework itself is the issue, not the lack of space in the Little Rock essay to make these distinctions in their complex histories clear. I shift away from the Little Rock essay to On Revolution in chapter four, The End of Revolution is the Founding of Freedom, where I examine Arendt's analysis of the American and French revolutions. I highlight the relationship between institutionalized slavery and the foundation of freedom and her analysis of the American Revolution Additionally, I examine her critique of the social question in the French Revolution and the issue of slavery in the French and Haitian revolutions, which is ignored by Arendt. Chapter five, a preparatory stage for the coming catastrophes, focuses on Arendt's analysis of race thinking, racism, and imperialism. I argue that the groundwork for race thinking and racism was laid before the age of imperialism as she describes it. Furthermore, although Arendt attempts to take a position against racism, there are elements of racism in her analysis and her descriptions of persons of African descent. Next, I explore the unbalanced response to violence in several of Arendt's writings. In chapter six, only violence and the rule over others could make some men free. I begin with an analysis of the theme of violence in the political realm as presented by Arendt and the human condition and on revolution. I argue that while she is uncritical of violence there, in other writings, she gives a very sharp criticism of violence and those she labels as violent. I show how Arendt's representation and critiques of Sartre and Fanon and on violence are inaccurate. Us using the analyses of Sartre and Fanon, I take the position that revolutionary violence is a legitimate and justified component of the decolonization process. In chapter seven, a much greater threat to our institutions of higher learning than student, student riots. I examine Arendt's discussion of the black power movement and student protests at colleges and universities. 
I argue that her understanding of the Negro question in the 10 years between Reflections on Little Rock and on Revolution did not improve and in fact worsened as evidenced by her blanket description of black students as academically unqualified to attend institutions of higher learning and her claims that they sought to lower academic standards through violence and threats of violence. The conclusion, the role of judgment and Arendt's approach to the Negro question provides an overview of the theme of the Negro question as taken up by Arendt and the various contexts already discussed with special attention to her conceptualization of judgment. I argue that rather than enlarging her understanding, her conception of judgment, which she derives from Kant, actually inhibits her understanding of the Negro question. The reception of my scholarship on Arendt falls into roughly three categories or three groups. At one end of the spectrum, there are readers who believe that I am not critical enough of Hannah Arendt. I will call them the Arendt espoused anti-black racism group. At the other end of the spectrum, there are readers who believe that I am overly and inaccurately critical of Arendt. I will call them the Hannah Arendt is innocent group. And someplace in between those binaries, there are readers who take me to be offering a thorough critical analysis of Arendt and anti-black racism and inquire about where we may go from here and how do we read, teach, and engage Arendt in light of these issues. I will, call, I will call them the what do we do about Hannah Arendt's anti-black racism group. Here are three examples of these readings. So Clarence Sholay Johnson, representing the Hannah Arendt espoused anti-black racism group, argues, Gein's analysis of Arendt is on target but it should also be evident why I think her criticism does not go far enough. It is a very serious matter to, uh, to allege anti-black racism at all, let alone to impute such a charge to an intellectual icon such as Arendt. Yet we must make such an allegation in the face of compelling evidence. We should not be timid to call a spade a spade, as the saying goes, and to name the culprits one by one, regardless of their intellectual stat stature. We must not fail to examine their views under the microscope and report our findings as they appear. I believe Gines is a bit hesitant to indict Arendt, although the evidence she has amassed does call for such an indictment. Does Arendt espouse anti-black racism? The answer from my perspective is yes, according to Johnson. Charles Snyder, representing the Hannah Arendt is Innocent group, asserts that Arendt is a political thinker who speaks in praise of civil disobedience. For him, any serious engagement with Arendt's civil disobedience finds her invoking the power of black Americans to amend through collective civil, civil disobedience the terms of the founding agreement known as the U.S. Constitution, an agreement that originally oppressed black Americans with legalized slavery and excluded them from the rights that accompany voluntary consent. Arendt reminds us, according to Snyder, at least those of us who have studied her remarks on civil disobedience, that no other minority group in the United States has a greater claim to revitalize the spirit of dissent and disobedience than do black Americans, for whom it continues to be a white lie to say, welcome to the Commonwealth, as wide as sorrow, as, as wide as, I'm sorry, welcome of the Commonwealth is as wide as sorrow. Snyder reviews, Snyder's review goes on to underscore other concepts in Arendt beyond civil disobedience, including mutual promising and other concepts. He states that Arendt says nothing positive or negative about social climbing in reflections on Little Rock, while also noting that she does make passion mention of social climbing in the 1965 reply to critics. Snyder is making multiple suggestions here. One, that my engagement with Arendt's civil disobedience is not a serious engagement, Two, that I have not studied Arendt's remarks on civil disobedience, mutual promising, social climbing, or equality, and perhaps more importantly for this review being placed into this group. Three, that Arendt's comments on black Americans and civil disobedience, coupled with her remarks about mutual promising, social climbing, and equality, somehow overrides all of the other problematics with Arendt's analysis of the so-called Negro question as already summarized in my comments today and more meticulously detailed in my book. Representing the third group, what do we do about Hannah Arendt's anti-black racism, I turn to the unpublished comments by Peg Birmingham from an author critic session at the APA. This is a reader for whom, in her words, the question of racism in Arendt's work has been a troubling murmur at the edges of her thought to which my book has given full voice. Birmingham asks, how are these sympathetic readers to judge Arendt's work in light of this? Does Arendt's anti-black racism reveal something fundamentally flawed in Arendt's conceptual framework that casts doubts on her entire political theory? 
This is a question that Birmingham leaves unanswered. I will say that I have no expectations that Arendtians, even those sympathetic to my arguments, will denounce Hannah Arendt, and that is not my intention. But if Arendtians teach and write her in a more honest way, in a way that places these issues at the center of her work rather than merely as murmurs on the margins, then that is a notable improvement. Grace Hunt offers another positive engagement with my group, with my book, noting that Gines makes original and significant contributions to feminist philosophy, applying various feminist and anti-colonial strategies, including standpoint theory and multi-directionality, to Arendt's political essays and concepts. Hannah Arendt and the Negro Question offers a novel and comprehensive racial critique of Arendt's major writings. In quick conclusion, I just want to um, end on a note of the notion of multi-directional memory from Michael Rothberg. So rather than taking a hierarchy of oppressions approach, I want to take seriously Michael Rothberg's use of the notion of multidirectional memory as a conceptual model to imagine how it's possible to remember the specificities of one history without silencing those of another. And he has in mind the issue of colonialism and totalitarianism. In multidirectional memory, remembering the Holocaust in the age of decolonization, Rothberg uses this notion of multidirectionality to offer a framework for appreciating the significance of both genocidal imperialism and the totalitarian Holocaust, which helps explain and even push beyond the uniqueness versus continuity debate. We continue to live in challenging times in which it is important to have multidirectional as well as intersectional frameworks. There is a long history and ongoing persistence of police brutality, sanctions, state-sanctioned killings, and mass incarceration, for example, in the United States. Much, not all, of the scholarship, public discourse, and media coverage around these issues tends to be unidimensional and single-axis oriented, for example, focusing on black boys and men. Multidirectionality and intersectionality allows us to see that it is not only black boys and men, but also black girls and women, black trans folks, as well as Latino, Latina, Latinxes, and indigenous populations who are also being targeted. Multidirectional memory creates a space for shared histories of jails, prisons, detention centers, and the separation of families in the United States through racialized chattel slavery, lynching, internment camps, immigration policies, and current practices of detaining and separating families. Intersectionality enlarges the frame and reveals the much bigger picture. It allows us to expand the myopic framework that centers black boys and men only, for example. Intersecting systems of oppression differenti differentially impact people existing at various intersecting identities. These co-constitutive and interlocking systems of oppression are not only racist, not only xenophobic, not only sexist, not only heterosexist, not only transphobic, not only ableist, not only capitalist, not only anti-Semitic, but often all these things simultaneously with specific impacts at the intersections as well as collective impacts across difference. Thank you. Buenos dias. Uh, shalom. And assalamu alaikum. And halito. Um, I normally, when I begin my talks, um, begin with shalom uh, uh, because I'm black and Jewish. But as I travel across the country these days, and especially people who speak as, as often and as, as I get to speak, uh, to give you an idea, there was one year I, gave, I did 200 flights. So I, I've seen a lot of airports, and I've seen a lot of cities, a lot of towns. But in the past year, I've seen something peculiar, which is the profound disappearance of Latinx people in public spaces. And if we were to make the question of, say, Jewish people metonymic, in other words, as a signification of what happens in certain periods in history, we're witnessing something right now that's profoundly dangerous profoundly cruel, and within that framework, it meant I had to start with Buenos Dias. I'm gonna go, bring up also, yeah, everybody knows I don't talk with my shoes on. And it's because 
when you stand before the ancestors, you stand, bare, you stand without shoes on. And the ancestors, as we know, are not physically here. However, in the very notion of an ancestor is a descendant. And we stand as descendants for those who are not here. But in their absence, through us, we have a form of accountability. So when we speak, the expectation that we speak truth means that there has to be an evidentiality that accounts not only to you before me and me before you, but in the very notion of an ancestor, descendants, which means simultaneously there are two sets of people who are absent. And of course, we're living in a period right now where there are people who abdicate accountability to ancestors and reject the idea of obligation to descendants. And such people believe that when they die, that is the end of the world. Which is one of the reasons why as we deal with the crises today, we're in some deep trouble. <laughs> because we can't say to them, what are you doing to your children? What are you doing to our species? Because their narcissism and solip solipsism leave them unaccountable to others. Now, I begin with this, of course, because this center, this very meeting, is about an ancestor, a beloved ancestor, Hannah Arendt. And she is connected in many ways. One of the things about her, whether we like her or dislike her, is she's an ancestor who devoted her life and her work to the quest for truth. Which means, of course, when she falls short, she too is accountable. Now, it's one of the things I'm going to begin with to talk about the way I talk about this question of Hannah Arendt and race. Many of you may have not heard the word theodicy. Theodicy basically is, how do you account for the existence of God in the presence of evil? And many of you have all had that conversation with your parents. You say, Mom, Dad... Why is there evil in the world? Why are there babies being blown up? Why, are there, why do nice people get harmed? Why is it that there are people who throw weapons, yell, you know, all kinds of invectives at a little black girl wanting to go to school? And your parents often had, if they were God-fearing, two answers. They're both from St. Augustine, by the way. Answer number one, who the hell are you to question the wisdom of God? God's infinite. You're finite. What the hell do you know? Answer number two. God in God's infinite wisdom and love has endowed us with free will, and we screwed it up. Now, what's important here is that both formulations take God, right, off the hook. Right? God is cool. The problem is us. However, if we, become, if we secularize this, we do the same thing when we deify or idolize. And idolatry is on my mind because you know, yesterday was Yom Kippur and we reflect on this issue. Idolatry is when we deify societies, modes of knowledge, individuals, and we rationalize them exactly the same way as in theodicy. And I give you an example. When I was in graduate school, I was reading, um, when I would read books by great thinkers such as Hume, Kant, Hegel, I remember saying to my classmates, wow, you know, these dudes really ain't like black people. And, and man, if you, if you want to read what they think of women. And of course, the response is, it's almost like the sitcom, different strokes. What you talking about, Lewis? <laughs> and I would say, yeah. And they would say, no, it isn't. Yes, it is. And of course, you eventually go and you point to the text. Or in my case, I do it rabbinically. <laughs> All right. And the response at first is rather interesting. Response number one is, how come I didn't see that before? Or another response is, okay, I see it, but it's not that important. Now, you have to understand when you're in the academy, 
There are people who write whole dissertations on one sentence of what these people say. So everything they say is important. And then there's a third one, which is not that I didn't see it or it's not important, but ultimately, it's not exactly what they meant, which is another way of saying it's not really there. Now, here's the mistake and why they get defensive. And this, in Catherine's talk, was hinted at. Because they think, when I'm pointing those infelicities of the text out, I am making a statement about whether we should read those people at all. I call that, frankly, the white way. <laughs> because, you see, what, what a lot of white people don't know is that black people have a very different attitude towards how you look at these issues in our society. You see? Because really, really reflect on it. There will be something really naive, really naive, about a black Jewish guy from the Bronx going to go study great German and Scottish thinkers and expect not to find an ounce of racism, a bit of sexism, a, 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 a de degradation of indigenous peoples. I mean, that'd be weird, wouldn't it? And so it struck me, you see, what that those colleagues, in order to read, actually have to sterilize what they read, which means they do not read. My argument wasn't this throw the baby out of the bathwater, don't read these people. My argument was actually really read these people. And that means I had to approach it pretty much the way a typical black person approach white people in American society, or indigenous person. And sorry, I'm gonna to have to say what it is. <laughs> the way we approach, most of us, not all, because there are very naive black people in the world and naive indigenous people, but the way we approach my, most white people is that um, um, if in our interactions you turn out not to be racist, if you don't turn out to be condescending and think we're inferior, then that is a pleasant surprise. That's the nutshell. We have to live and with people on a daily basis we know don't respect us, don't see us as equally human, don't, the long list of don'ts, but we survive. We face it, we live with it. But my white colleagues who responded in those other ways needed to turn Kant, Hegel, Hume into idols, which meant they were failing to remember these are books written by human beings. And because I recognized the humanity of the people I read, I could face their contradictions. And I say that because that's how I teach Hannah Arendt. When I was at Brown, I had a seminar on Hannah Arendt where we read every text of hers that were in print. And it's a striking experience because my classes tend to be not only large, but for some reason heavily multiracial. And so I get to see people from a variety of backgrounds how they respond. And there are some people who get because now they're really reading, they see those infelicities. And some want to dismiss her. And others are trying to, and then finally I have to explain, why are you reading her in a Theodician way? Why don't you read her as a human being whom if she were alive, you would argue with about her positions? Why don't you engage her with all the due respect and critique you would of any thinker, myself even as the professor included. And so we, I'm, and so I'm gonna be brief here so we can go to the conversation. So we get to look at those issues, but you know, even, even when we look at totalitarianism, there's this thing, it's almost like a 
race trigger that happens when Hada Arendt has to talk about black people. Even in totalitarianism, when she examines the Boers, her analysis of them comes down to what happens ultimately to Europeans if they spend too much time around savages. And we know who the savages were. When in her analysis, that pattern continued also, not only in how she would analyze, even though there, there's an effort to try to look through in her categories with Little Rock, but it's particularly profound, as Jane Anna Gordon points out in a book called Why They Couldn't Wait, when she looks at the student movements in New York City, where the presupposition is that the entrance of black people is to pull down standards. But everybody knows that what pulls down standards of education in the United States is rich people. <laughs> and I know, I've taught in all kinds of institutions. Everybody knows it, right? That actually the truth is, at the intellectual, the moral, and the political level, these people were trying to raise the standards of these institutions. And if we think about this, we begin to see that in that, that kind of critique, there's something more going on. And at the intellectual level, and I'm going to close with this, there are three things we should think about. The first one is that the complexity of European Jews in the US context raise, I think, a profound crisis. And that is because the country that was their salvation is the country that decimated the indigenous, was actually what was going on in Europe, as Amy Cezier said, was to do in Europe what was done in the Americas. So the idea that your salvation is a country that by the end of the 19th century killed off 96% of the indigenous population and was doing what it did on a daily level to the degradation of the black population created a profound political existential crisis. For Franz Boas, it was very different because he proactively got involved in the question of the humanity of these people. But there are others for whom it was such a salvation that they began to collapse into a form of idolatry. They began to rationalize American society to make its contradictions external rather than internal to its condition. And that, that kind of a rationalization then makes the people, the problems, as Catherine pointed out, instead of addressing the people with the problems, which are those who are making those people into the problems. And then the last two that begin to come through, of course, is the complexity of the history of Jewish people in the formation of race. In the discussion part, because I don't take up too much time, I could bring up why, but there's been an effort to separate Jewish people from race. But many people know that prior to the 20th century, mostly in North America, Jewish people were, doesn't matter how light skin you may be, I know this through my relatives and everybody else, because just for those curious, I'm a born Jew, okay? This is not any conversion thing. And it's not to put conversion converts down, but it's just to put it on the table. Jews were people of color. And the very question then of delinking that intimacy had consequences of how to talk about the question of Jews and race. And the very last one, and this is crucial intellectually for Hannah Arendt, is because she's very astute at dealing with the question of what the concept of political is. But the project of American society is to evade the political by demonizing the political through the supervenience of the moral, which works for a form of liberalism in which it will be impossible actually to articulate a group category such as race. This is why many Americans know very well how to evade talking about racism and very well how to maintain it. To address it, 
One has to address the political dimensions of race, which requires political solutions, which would ironically make her astute observations on political categories highly resonant for that debate. But we can talk more since we need the time. Thank you. Now it's on, sorry. I'll learn one day. Um, thank you both. Um, we have about 15 minutes for questions. Um, I, I'll ask one to get us going. Um, Catherine, you, you put the responses in three categories. Uh, I, I take it the one that you find most important, and I would agree with you, is that we put race in the center. Uh, Peg, or that was the quote from Peg. Um, but that was the one you used in the, in the category of how, you, how do we move on? How do we talk about this? And so um, at the end of his talk, Lewis raised the question of Hannah Arendt's idea of politics and being useful for race. So I'm wondering, what would be interesting for both of you is, in the Hannah Arendt Center, I was not a Hannah Arendt scholar when I started the Hannah Arendt Center. When it first came to me, someone asked me to do it, and I said, I don't want to create a mausoleum for Hannah Arendt, right? That's not our goal. We have conferences on things like racism and anti-Semitism. There's a connection, but we're not an Arendt scholarship organization. But in what sense is, how do we put race in the center of Hannah Arendt's work? Or in what sense, what, what issues of, what, what parts of Arendt's work are you most interested in? Or what issues do you most think that her work can help us in to put race in the center and and offer us a way to think forwardly uh, about race through her work? Where would you look? So I wouldn't so much say that the goal is to put race in the center. So for me, that third category is, okay, how do we deal with what, how do we really confront what's there on race instead of, you know, and I think um, Lewis did a good job at kind of breaking down these categories of either ignoring that they're there altogether or saying like, we're just not gonna read these texts altogether. So part of my point is what does it mean to, because, well, and I say this more broadly, I think Hannah Arendt is a case study for the Western philosophical canon, right? Like there's this way in which anybody that you read in the canon, there's gonna be be issues of anti-black racism, other forms of racism. There's going to be issues of sexism, homophobia, and all of these things. And what happens when we read these figures as if those things do not exist in the text? What happens when we get really defensive and want to attack the people who point out that those things are in the text that we've pretended are not there? And what I want to invite scholars and professors and students and readers of these texts to do is you know, read what's actually there instead of pretending that these issues are kind of being imposed from the outside. Um, so, so that's the invitation. Like, what, what does it mean for us to read these texts and take seriously what, what she actually did say and what's problematic about it? Um, I say in the book, I mean, part of what I find, find interesting about Arendt is that she often has been presented as the figure who kind of got it right. Like, she's about pluralism. You know, she doesn't have the same issues that the other people in the Western philosophical canon have. And so part of what I'm doing in the book is showing how the Little Rock essay can't just be separated out from the rest of the corpus, right? The operating assumptions in the Little Rock essay feed into a lot of the other reading um, or, or exist in the other um, writings and things like that that she has. And so rather than trying to compartmentalize, what does it mean to just read those issues ac across the text? So what I do find helpful about her text is the ways in which she, even though I don't always agree with her distinctions at the end of the day, I think she is very good at distinction making and making us think about the terms that she's comparing or differentiating from one another in helpful and productive and fruitful ways. So I think those are one of the things that I find really helpful about how she approaches things. Um, but ultimately, you know, as I said, I really, I have a lot of criticisms of how she approaches um, issues of anti-black racism in particular. Yeah. So Louis, you, you talked about her politics or her thinking about politics as a potential way to bring her work, I take it, I took your point, maybe I, if I got it right, into the question of race and how to think about race politically. Is that right? Well, to that, uh, good. To that, I, uh, I agree, agree thoroughly with what Catherine just said. The mistake people make these days is that they think that we have to put a particular position at center, but, they, but then we ahistoricize, acontextualize them. The, the thing is to understand and dignify the importance of these issues along with other issues. 
For instance, the way I argue is that once we understand race is relational, I, don't, I really don't know how to talk about race without talking about its relationship to gender, class, and sexuality because I don't know about the rest of you, but I've never seen a race walking. And I've never seen a gender walking by itself. But here's the crucial thing. I, I think where she is very important, and this is the way I've used her in my writings as well, is that if you look at the way liberal theory talks about politics, it's as if it, politics and power are not connected. Hannah Arendt always connects power with politics. And this is crucial because if we make now, not talk about race, but talk about racism, not sex, but sexism, okay? Not, not just sexuality, but say homophobia or anti-lesbian. The isms are connected to practices of disempowerment. Mm -hmm. In other words, the history of Euro modernity and colonization has been a systematic disempowering of people, which means that if we're going to talk about their transformation, it requires the empowerment of people. And here's where I think she's very, very interesting, and, and, and this is something with which I agree, and it's very important. The danger when we moralize these issues is that we treat people as if they're individual gods who can transform the world. But if we understand them as political issues, we understand that they are practices of citizenship that need to be done to transform these transgressions, these dehumanizing practices, et cetera. And here's where there's the irony with Arendt, because the times at which he was being very critical of black people was black people actually exercising citizenship. They weren't going in with guns, and et cetera. They were actually defending their right of public assembly, speech, et cetera. And so I think that she was blindsided by certain prejudices, but her argument themselves are very useful, particularly around this question that we need to deal with, which is the understanding that democracy is also about the idea of the public dimensions of power. And a society in which power is used for disempowerment creates oppression. A society in which its institutions cultivate the participation of people as citizens of the society. I don't mean simply the question of legal citizen. I'm talking the ability to appear publicly for the facilitation of human flourishing. I think she was right on there. And so this is the kind of conversation, I think, that in actually debating her can actually create a very positive way of addressing this question of race and racism and the varieties of forms of hatred in our society, including the question of the hatred of Jews and what people would call anti-Semitism. Great. Are there, I'm happy to continue up here, but I'm just wondering if there's burning questions from the audience. Um, I'm gonna, I'll continue then and say, and ask a question. So let's talk about the Little Rock essay just for a second, right? Um, it's an essay, um, as I said, that uh, when she wrote it, originally commentary wouldn't publish it. Uh, eventually, Descent published it with a, with a, with a disclaimer. Um, and, and I guess I'd like, so I'd, first, what's, what in your mind is the biggest mistake in the essay that she makes, um, both of you. I mean, what, what do you think is, in your minds today, the thing we should take away that she really got wrong? It's hard for me to say one thing. All right, but ask I, 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 I know. I I'm committed three chapters to that essay. I think she gets, I mean, aside from like some of the historical facts that she gets wrong, I think some of the things that really stand, well, and let me just give some, a little bit about my background even coming to that essay. My mother is an attorney. She went to law school when I was between the ages of like five and seven. And um, she often supplemented my public education so that whenever I had to do any kind of project on history, she made sure it was like black history, you know what I mean? So I knew about the Brown v. Board of Education case as a child. I knew about the Little Rock case as a child, even, you know, I mean, it was before my time, but it was, those are things that my mother was very intentional about teaching me about. So when I confronted her version of that 
it was so at odds with what my experience in teaching about that case had been or, or just that time um, in U.S. history had been or what American families and parents were doing in preparing their children to integrate public schools. So part of my issue, or, or one of the many issues, one is like the historical facts of it, like she's describing one photograph when um, she's talking about another, she, she misidentifies which photograph she's talking about. Another one is this operating assumption that, um, that, that black Americans were, really did think they were trying to improve their quality of life by being with, with white folks and in white schools. And that was never the impetus of the integration effort um, for black Americans. So a lot of what I do in the book is look at the legal history of how we got to Brown v. Board and the various ways in which they were trying to really disrupt Plessy versus Ferguson um, more broadly. Um, so starting with education and then looking at other areas. So I think one of the issues is this idea that it was about social climbing or that it was about black Americans just wanting to be with white, um, be, be around white families and white kids. Um, I think another issue that I have with it is um, this assumption that it was a social and not a political issue. Um, you know, go, going back to what Lewis just said and what I also articulate in the book, right? So describing education as not a political issue um, for me, I think, is is wrong because, it, you know, again, this was about exercising their legally gained rights to integrate those public schools. Um, and then another one is just the general kind of condescension or assumption that black folks were not political thinkers or actors, right? Um, just in terms of how those actions get interpreted, right? So, so they are actually doing the things that she describes as political and, and powerful and, you know, people coming together for a common purpose, but she simply refuses to see their behavior in that way um, in the Little Rock essay. So those are some of the issues that I have with it. Do you want to jump in, or should I? Go to another one. I mean, why? Well, I, I, okay, because so, we so, could go on forever on that one. Why? Well, I, I, so well, and I'll add one more since Lewis. I'm, I'll take Lewis's part. It's the whole thing about the marriage laws, right? So this idea that, okay, well, if you really want to get at the issue, you should be focusing on the anti-miscegenation laws and not the school laws. And so one of the other things I point out at the book is that those two things were interrelated, right? The reason why they didn't want, or one of the reasons why white folks did not want black kids in school with white kids is they did not want black boys with access to white women, white girls' bodies, right? So, what, I mean, and this is still playing out in 2019. I mean, they've been shutting down homecoming dances and things like that because they don't want there to be a black homecoming king or in a white homecoming queen kind of thing. Um, so those are not mutually exclusive issues, but the idea that, okay, well, you know, black people had their order of priorities wrong and what they should have been focusing on was anti-miscegenation and not access to public, you know, equal, equal access to public education okay, is another look, issue. Can I ask you a little bit about that? Because sure. that's a, I mean, her argument, for those who don't know the essay, right, where she says that it, in her mind, it was a more important issue to first address anti-miscegenation laws than, than, than um, school segregation. Um, her argument, as I understand it, is uh, it is a human right, from her point of view, to be able to marry who you want, right? She's a, a Jewish woman who married a non-Jewish man. Uh, she took that as a very serious uh, human right. Um, she thought, she also thought it was a human right that parents had to educate their children as they saw fit, right? Which is a, not a social issue so much as a privacy issue. Um, um, and so she thought that, if, she just thought that if you were going to argue one first, that made sense. But her, the other side of it was she said that while she believed fundamentally that segregation was unconstitutional in a legalized sense, what she said was, you wouldn't force people to marry people of another, of another religion or race. Why should you force parents to send their kids to another school? So I'm just wondering, to what extent those arguments are arguments that you think are important to counter or, 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 or engage? I could speak now. Yeah. yeah. They're, they're highly fallacious arguments. Okay. I mean, the first, let, let's start with the miscegenation argument. You know that point when I was talking about how white people see white people? What white people don't see is how violent white people are. You could make laws that say that, um, that, that miscegenation is legal, and then they'll just go lynch a bunch of people. And there's a whole criminal justice system that don't hold white people accountable for the brutalization, the destruction, the violence they unleash on black people. So that's the first part. The second part is 
that she is, she, there's nothing in the argument around the forced integration of public schools that prevents, because of the imbalance of resources available to white people versus black people, for white people privately to raise their children as they want. In other words, I have no problem that there are white people who hate black people and they're gonna keep their children at home and go to all white schools. They just gotta pay for that crap themselves. But black people's tax money going to public schools. It's a public trust and blows black people are fighting for what they had every bit of right to. So her argument there was grotesquely naive and fallacious. The other part at the end of the day, when we talk about the question of the public, and this is why I was saying the political part, given her argument, by, by definition, uh, access to education is, is vital for the question of citizenship. And if she's going to defend those arguments, she's going to have to take the, the position that, the, that, that, and that, uh, that not only there should be access to such institutions by all groups, but she's also going to have to deal with the, 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 the deeper issue about, uh, and this is a more radical structural issue, about the very fact that that tax money was structuring a form of social welfare system for the production of white wealth. In other words, the reason whites were able to be more mobile and have more control over the conditions available to their children was precisely because of the use of the public trust. And so there are many arguments that could be used to counter it, but the main one is both arguments are fallacious precisely because they're too formal and are not looking at the very question of the society in which those arguments are being articulated. But, but if you say they're too formal, it, what happened was whites fled those schools and pretty much the same thing happened. So I don't see how they're formal. I think they're actually quite human. Now what they're, I mean that's formal is that she was not addressing this larger issue of the fact that those whites had options that the black populations did not. There's a greater justice issue to be dealt with around the question of access and the very institutions. In other words, fine if those whites flee. The real question is, why did public resources also abandon the schools when they became majority black? And when they're majority white, they were well invested in. I don't care if white people leave these schools, to be frank. The point is black people's tax money, Puerto Rican people, Dominican people, indigenous American people, they should all have access to excellent public schools. Okay. I think, unfortunately, we're, we're past time, so I apologize. I would love to keep this going, but please thank Catherine and Lewis. I thank you. I, I, one thing I want to say is that I think it's absolutely essential to bring this kind of thinking about Arendt into the Arendt scholarship world, and both of you have done it a more, an, an important service in doing that, so thank you for that. So um, the next, uh, the next um, panel, which we're gonna go right into, is uh, a performance and talk by uh, Emilio Rojas, our visiting colleague here at Bard, and it's gonna be chaired by Nano Adasupoku. Uh, can I invite you guys both up to, for the next session? Thank you.
Hello, hello, hello. Here is a rock, here is a rock whispering in a mountain to be carried. Here is my head waiting for some heavy weight to think clearly. The historic continuum we inherited by virtue of being born breathing. Sins of our fathers, deeds of our ancestors, burden and blessing, which is which. We carry them both like anger, heavy with fire, guilt, duty and desire. Here, is a rock waiting for a head to think clearly, waiting. Here is my head whispering in a mountain, waiting to be carried into the water. Here is a rock waiting. Here is a rock waiting. Here is a rock dreaming of being an island. Here is my head and my voice. Here is my head and my voice, which underwater cannot breathe, but in the drowning silence finally feels hurt and free. In the final page of Hannah Arendt's Eichmann in Jerusalem, a report on the banality of evil, she poses the conundrum of political responsibility, collective guilt, or for that matter, collective innocence. Arendt states, every generation, by virtue of being born into a historical continuum, is burdened by the sins of our fathers and is blessed by the deeds of our ancestors. I want to start here because this is what gives the title to this lecture and my attempt to think about the relationship of burden and blessing, which is deeply entangled with our survival. No matter our position and privilege, this intersectionality of a race, gender, class, ability, sexuality, desires, we all carry a burden and a blessing, but which is which? It is our ability to discern these two gifts that allows us to transform feelings of guilt into action. I'm interested in how the sins are specifically gender as our fathers, a not so subtle way for a reign to blame patriarchy for the misdeeds and the blessings that are talked about come from the ancestors, pulling forward what I would like to think a line of black and brown women, queer and indigenous thinkers, makers, lovers, and revolutionaries. 
First of all, I want to acknowledge that this talk is taking place in the Hudson Valley, a region that serves as trading ground and home for various indigenous nations, but specifically to this area, the Lenape and the Stockbridge Mohican. I also want to acknowledge that I stand here before you because I've been nurtured and raised by a brigade of women, queer mentors, and brown and black fighters that have defended our rights of expression, civil liberties, and well-being, many of who have passed. These are my ancestors. Florian Saldua, Terry Moraga, Thea Rustin, Audrey Lord, Jose Esteban Munoz, Patria Jimenez, Franz Fanon, Tania Bruguera, Ernesto Pujol, Bojet, Rebecca Belmont. They stand behind me. They stand behind me. I want to invite you to bring your ancestors into the room, those people who have nurtured and raised you, to also be participants, to also join the circle. I also want to acknowledge the events that happened last week at Simon Rock, and I want to dedicate the performance to the young black woman who was attacked and survived. May you learn to keep each other safe in the face of hate. Whether these attacks were racially motivated or not, the ripples of this violence have been felt in our community, and we are still processing the effects. I think about racism daily, not just for a conference, and the subtle ways in which it's been imprinted as marked on our bodies, the daily microaggressions and direct attacks that we survive, and that this disability which makes us most vulnerable is also the source of our greatest strength. I've been thinking about safety in the face of racism, xenophobia, homophobia, anti-Semitism, and sexism. We've been having conversations this past week about safety, about feeling unsafe. I realize I never fully feel safe. I do not believe in safe spaces. I believe in safer spaces. But for some of us, safety stands always in an unattainable place. I think on the way Esteban, Jose Esteban Munoz wrote about queerness, another territory in my body where I've never felt fully safe. I'm replacing queerness with the word safety in the opening paragraph of Pusing Utopia. So it reads, safety is not yet here. Safety an unattainable place of always becoming. We are not safe yet. We may never touch safety, but we can feel it as the warm illumination of a horizon imbued with potentiality. We have never been safe, yet safety exists for us. It is an ideality that can be distilled from the past and used to imagine a future. I still watch over my shoulder every time I kissed a man because I was gay bashed the moment I thought it was safe to surrender into my lover's arms. I ask myself, what makes me feel safe? I ask my students the same question as they walk around the classroom, looking at each other in the eye. I certainly cannot remember when was the last time I felt safe. Other students of color in class can't either. All of a sudden, I remember an instant, a very early moment of safety. After a near drowning experience as a child, I remember the first time I wore a life jacket. I was approximately five years old. I remember being on a lake and realizing that with this device, it was impossible for me to sink.
I still do. I turn my fear into a tool of survival. I urge the same to you. When I think about tools and our relationship to our survival, I immediately think of Audre Lorde. Those of us, quoting, those of us who stand outside the circle of society's definition of acceptable women, those of us who have been forged in the crucibles of difference, those of us who are poor, who are lesbians, who are black, who are older, know that survival is not an academic skill. It is learning how to take our differences and make them strengths. For the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. They may allow us to temporarily beat him at his own game, but they will never enable us to bring about genuine change. And what would genuine change would look like? And would institutions like this one survive it? I found this jacket years ago, caught in between two rocks in the Belmont Harbor in Chicago, a place historically known for cruising during the 80s and 90s, and later turned into a cement walkway during the AIDS crisis, pulverizing the rocks where men used to love one another a love that dare not speak its name. I went down to the rocks and struggled to retrieve this life jacket. I didn't know what to do with it, but I wanted to carry it. This week, it finally spoke to me. Through the conference, you'll see me breaking this device apart, switching stitch by stitch while having conversations with you about safety, while carrying this rock in my head what follows is the real performance. These are just some thoughts attempt 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 at 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 attempt attempting attempt attempting attempting to deconstruct this metaphor of being safe in the face of hate and fear. Is it the color of the jacket that makes me feel safe? The fact that it can be seen from a distance. Is it the feeling of floating when we should be sinking? The surrender that comes from letting go? As Warshan Shire wrote in the poem, Home, you have to understand that no one puts their children in a boat unless the water is safer than the land. I remember seeing images of refugee life jackets piled into mountains at Lesbos. I thought about each jacket as a life made, who made, which made it through, as an absence, as a memorial to survival. This image haunted me for years. A former student of mine, Evan, uh, Evan Johnson, emailed me this week. He asked me if I knew a photographer who could collaborate with him in a visual campaign about children of color drowning to be placed in the Chicago public transportation system, guerrilla style. He mentioned being inspired by a reading in our class that Bayer Rustin, class of Bayer Rustin, where he stated, the only weapon that we have is our bodies and we need to tuck them in places so wheels don't turn. He's 36 an Afghanistan veteran, a marine, a fantastic swimmer. He recently found out a startling fact and sent me a study from the CDC. The email read, what can we do? In the United States, almost 4,000 persons die from drowning each year. Drowning is responsible for more deaths amongst children aged one to four than any other cost except congenital anomalies. Research has identified racial ethnic disparities in drowning rates. Disparities were greatest in swimming pools, with swimming pool drowning rates among blacks aged 5 to 19, five times higher than those among whites in the same age group. This disparity was greatest ages 11 to 12. At this age, black children drown in 
swimming pools 10 times higher rate, unquote. He asked me if we can have a conversation. I gave him my number. Two days ago, we talked over the phone about racism. We talked about slavery and enslaved people being forbidden to swim in order not to escape by water. We talked about scientific racism, about the myth that black people do not float. We talked about ways to start a national swimming program from children of color where marine veterans teach children how to swim. We talked about his, how he stopped carrying a gun after my class because he understood that police wouldn't see a hero, a veteran, someone who had stopped a shooting from happening. They would see a black person holding a gun. We all know the outcome of this equation. The feeling of safety is not the absence of fear. It is a recognition of harm. It is the acute intuition of knowing when it's coming. What Gloria Saldúa describes as la facultad. Those who are pushed out of the tribe for being different are likely to become more sensitized. Those who do not feel physically or psychologically safe in the world are more apt to develop the sense those who are pounds the most have it strongest. The females, the homosexuals of all races, the dark skin, the outcast, the persecuted, the marginalized, the foreign. When we're up against the wall, when we have all sorts of oppressions coming at us, we are forced to develop this faculty so we'll know when the next person is going to slap us or lock us away Pain makes us acutely anxious to avoid more of it. So we hone that radar. It is a kind of survival tactic that people caught in between worlds unknowingly cultivate. I think of this as a burden and a blessing. What makes you feel safe might not make me feel the same. Nana and I go out dancing. She suddenly asked me, if something happens, which exit should we run towards? This is a question I've asked myself in every single public space. I've ever been to. I know how we know where the exits are. I know and I've approximated how fast I can get to them, how can I get my friends to safety, and also the best hiding place in case the exit is not reachable. I just want to play it safe. How do we build safer spaces? I wake up every morning waiting for the blow. I'm not wondering anymore if there, is, if there will be one. I wonder its direction and its angle, its impact. I wonder if this blow will knock me down. Who in my communities is getting attacked? How do we prepare for the blow delivered, usually on a tweet? How do we organize? Who is getting attacked? Immigrants being gassed in the southern border, women denied abortion rights, refugees turned back, deported, families separated, children in cages, Muslims banned from traveling, a police officer getting another lenient sentence, a trans woman fired from her workplace, another one murdered, the whole LGBTQ plus community at risk, the environment being destroyed, children coming back from school to find their parents missing after a massive ice raid in Mississippi on the first day of school. DNA tests imposed on every detained migrant just this week. I wonder how it feels to feel safe, to live in a land that loves you back. In her essay, We Refugees, Arendt writes, apparently no one wants to know that contemporary history had created a new kind of human being, that kind that it's put in concentration camps by its foes and in internment camps by its friends. A few months ago, I visited the Anne Frank Museum in Amsterdam, which is basically the house where she hid for 25 months before she was, being, before she was found by the Gestapo. 
And a white American woman in the waiting line was asking her husband, how did Europeans allow something like this to happen? Where was their humanity? How did they slept at night? I turn around and ask her, how are you allowing for the same things to be happening to migrants in your country, for families to be separated, for children to be in cages, for immigrants to be treated as criminal and put in concentration camps? Where is your humanity? How can you sleep? She was outraged and left the line. Inside the museum, I found a quote written January 13, 1943, by Anne Frank, terrible things are happening outside. At any time, at night and day, poor helpless people are being dragged out of their homes. Families are torn apart. Men, women, and children are separated. Children come home from school to find that their parents have disappeared. Arendt writes, evil comes from the failure to think. It defies thought, for as soon as thought tries to engage itself with evil and examine the premises and principles from which it organizes, it is frustrated because it finds nothing there. That is the banality of evil. I think about the ICE officer putting a child on a cage in a yelera, an ice box, and then coming back home to put his children to sleep, reads them a bedtime story, tucking them in. I've heard this immigration officers dragging children from their mothers, saying that they're just doing their job. Eichmann also stated the same statement in trial. I was only doing my job. How do we separate this machinery of evil from its human parts? What makes you feel safe? As Glorian Saldúa states, my job as an artist is to bear witness to what haunts us, to step back and attempt to see the pattern in these events and how we can repair el daño, the damage, by using the imagination and its visions. I believe in the transformative power and medicine of art. Though we tremble before uncertain futures, may we meet illness death and adversity with strength, may we dance in the face of our fears. I want to finish this by the same way I started, with a poem, a poem by Audre Lorde, a poem that is linked to my own survival, a poem that I read every day to remember that we were never meant to survive. For those of us who live at the shoreline, standing upon the constant edges of decision, crucial and alone. For those of us who cannot indulge in the passing dreams of choice, who love in doorways, coming and going in the hours between duns, looking inward and outward at once, before and after, seeking a now that can breed futures like the bread in our children's mouth, so their dream will not reflect the death of ours. For those of us who are imprinted with fear, like a faint line in the center of our foreheads, learning to be afraid with our mother's milk, for by this weapon, the illusion of some safety to be found, the heavy-footed hoped to silence us. For those of us, for all of us, this instant and this triumph, we were never meant to survive. And when the sun rises, we are afraid it may not remain. When the sun sets, we are afraid it may not raise in the morning. When our stomachs are full, we are afraid of indigestion. When our stomachs are empty, we are afraid we may never eat again. When we are loved, we are afraid love will banish. When we are alone, we are afraid love will never return. And when we speak, we are afraid our words will not be heard nor welcome. But when we're silent, 
we are still afraid. So it's better to speak remembering we were never meant to survive. Hello. Um, please give a warm applause for Emilio Rojas, who is currently visiting artists in residence. I just want to quickly um, say that, as Emilio stated, this performance is not over yet. He will keep um, Coming back. asking you about um, your... Emilio, we um, are wrapping up because of time reasons, but there will be possibilities to ask him questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Emilio and Nanya. Thank you so much. Um, I'm now going to invite up for the next panel um, uh, Jennifer Kidwell, Scott Shepard, and Kenyon Victor Adams, and we'll go right into the next panel. There'll be a break after this one, I promise. Um, Kenyon, yes, I see you. Jennifer? Are Jennifer and Scott here? Yeah. Uh, this is an exciting panel for a whole lot of reasons. Is it on? Yes. So this is an exciting panel for a whole lot of reasons. Um, for those of you who've been coming to the conference, we, you know we often end the conference uh, with a performance. And last year, uh, we ended the conference with uh, Kenyon's Prayers for the People, uh, which was um, an extraordinary uh, performance for a lot of us uh, in the chapel over at Bard, uh, uh, based on Martin Luther King's letter from the Birmingham jail. And uh, it led to a number of conversations at the conference and also afterwards about uh, performance and art and how it works in society and works to uh, address the racial imaginary and other things of that sort. I had already seen and actually Two years ago at the conference, I gave the opening talk in which I talked about the play that I had seen in New York, The Underground Railroad Game, uh, which was uh, done by Jennifer Kidwell and Scott Shepard. Um, and when we decided to do this conference on racism and anti-Semitism, I immediately said to a number of people, we have to try and bring them up to do this, to, to do their play. And so the first performance at Bard was, I think, last night. Congratulations. Uh, they both wrote the play and star in it, uh, and don't direct it. Someone else directs it, right? You get someone else involved. Um, but so what we have up here are, are three people whose theater works are now going to be long associated with the RN Center and our conferences. Um, and they all are people who, at least in my mind, um, are engaged with trying to think about how art uh, remakes us challenges our imaginations about a uh, whole lot of things, including uh, race. Um, so uh, I know many of you haven't seen the play yet. It's going to be playing the next three days. Um, and a number of us are going to see it tomorrow night after the conference. There's still some tickets left, I believe. So if you haven't gotten tickets, I highly imagine, I encourage it. We're not going to try and give too much away because there's some things in the play, but I'll let you guys figure it out. But I thought... I'm gonna, we'll speak openly. We'll speak openly. Yeah. Um, in any case, it's a very, it, it's a play in which I'll just say, from my seeing it, not knowing exactly what to expect when I saw it, 
Um, it was one of the most honest and moving plays I've ever seen in my life. And I, I really appreciated that. And something that I continue to talk about and think about three years after I saw it or so. So um, I wanted to start this by asking um, Kenyon to maybe speak a little bit about the racial imaginary and what he means by it. And then maybe we'll bring you guys into that conversation, if that's OK. Yeah, thank you, Roger. Uh, wonderful to be here. I'm happy to be a part of this community. Uh, I live in New York City. And uh, I often uh, talk about this community and the kind of commitments it has to discourse. And so I'm just thankful to be here. I look forward to meeting many of you that I haven't met yet. Um, some of us have already shared a kind of intimate moment if you were part of Prayers of the People last, last year. Um, and I think it's wonderful that the conference includes this sort of layer of the poetics, but also through the, um, the rigor of the performative. So it puts it in the body. Um, so I know many of you will be, were there last night uh, for the opening of Underground Railroad Game, and many of you will be experiencing it as the conference progresses. And I think that's a really wonderful layer. Um, I also very much want to just acknowledge and thank um, Emilio Rojas, uh, and, and just acknowledge the silences that the poetic space can allow. Um, I think in a sort of Howard Thurman tradition of thinking, without contemplation, there is no just action. <laughs> so I'm so thankful for that contribution. Um, and of course, to be here. I'm still learning uh, when I'm not you know, performing or writing a song or a poem, I'm still learning about what it means to have uh, discourses with people I disagree with, especially when the stakes are high. Um, so thank you for letting me be a part of this. And before I share a few thoughts uh, in that spirit, I'd actually like to try to respond to something that was said in the first session, if that's all right, Roger, what I think relates. Um, I think it's important to say, um, given Mr. McCorder's remarks, that from the perspective of the artist, at least, uh, maybe the artist's vocation, that to I identify and resist the harm of racism or racism itself by naming it, contextualizing it historically, and addressing it through various means, that may at times actually include weeping, is not a demonstration of weakness or being dramatic, but of courage often, faith, uh, intelligence, and is the kind of work it will take to construct an equitable future, and one not defined by gendered and racialized assumptions about the human being. I think that relates to uh, this work uh, of Scott and Jennifer. Um, I haven't actually heard a lot about whiteness uh, today. Uh, not that it's a subject I like to belabor, um, but I wish I could assume it was because there's such a strong grasp in the room that we can assume such a deep familiarity and it uh, doesn't need to be addressed. But uh, from my perspective, it's futile to discuss racism without discussing whiteness and its agency, how it functions. Uh, Reverend Lewis uh, began uh, this morning to lay a foundation for considering a theological account of colonial dynamics, theological account of colonial attitudes and postures. One of the primary functions of colonialism uh, one which is distinctly demonstrated in the concept and agency of whiteness is its ability to propose and claim its own undefinable universality, while the rest of the world and its peoples remain particular, if that makes sense, such that the experiences and narratives of various peoples bear the weight of distinctive, containable, definable, and therefore able to be possessed particularity of being. On this point, uh, I want to um, refer to the educative space, um, the classroom space, which is where the Underground Railroad game is sort of set. Uh, and rightly, even this morning, there were suspicions raised about the idea of sort of teaching out the racism uh, as being a way to respond to uh, ongoing disparities. I think if we took time uh, to address the and identify the way in which whiteness works uh, and establishes itself within the educative space, particularly in this country, 
um, which is something I believe is addressed in Underground Railroad game, uh, we would see that whiteness's claim of universality translates as a kind of provision of primacy or, or centeredness, while the white identifying person experience themselves as central in a narrative sense, they do not have the capacity to claim a corresponding particularity. And in the classroom, it means that non-white students experience, let's call it a distinct hyper-visibility. Virtually, I would imagine, inconceivable to white identified people. This hyper-visibility disrupts uh, what I think is sort of a human right, that sense of privacy and solitude that so strengthens a student when, when they slip into a classroom to begin to develop a life of contemplation towards just action. The thinking life that's heralded at this conference and in this institution. In terms of the racial imaginary, I think of it as being comprised of all that is required when once you establish that people can be white. Then you have to reshape your theology, your medical research, your system of justice, you have to rethink your senses, your representation. Once it's possible that anyone can be white, and the heuristic of the game, or maybe the plain terms of the game, is so stringent, uh, meaning that a good game has a perfect logic which must hold together, or kids will abandon it and get bored. <laughs> you know, they won't play Red Rover if it doesn't make sense. So I, I guess, in effect, uh, a game is a brilliant way to get at what we are playing at with whiteness and what the stakes are, and in effect, how to win. About the Underground Railroad game, uh, there's a great, a great quote from the play, and I actually don't have it precisely, so maybe you can help me. Uh, I think it summarizes the contribution of the play to kind of current uh, discourses, uh, national discourses in particular, that the idea that the Underground Railroad story is the silver lining of, of slavery and colonialism. Uh, one thing I really appreciate about this, this piece is its technique of using the space and the work of play to be a pedagogical space, and then this implication that that's another aspect of the educative technique or strategies in the United States, uh, which has inspired this piece. Um, as I've been reflecting, uh, maybe just briefly once more on the racial imaginary, I don't, think, I don't think, and I think this play presents some examination of this, I think there's really only one uh, sort of racial imaginary, and we talked about this a bit last night. I don't, I don't think that the two things, sort of you know, blackness and whiteness, are truly akin, or maybe at least not anymore. So I think the racial imaginary is a term uh, that distinctly serves non-black audiences or audiences that center whiteness as a primary experience or sort of common ground, which also can be shared by uh, non-white people. It helps whiteness become consciously visible and experiential at the personal and systemic level. So in a room in which pan-African identity and perspectives are centered, I think it's less of an urgent question and theme, since black experience uh, necessarily involves a navigation of whiteness as a functioning agency identity and social system. Uh, this is critical because one of the key differences between black beingness and whiteness is how blackness pushes one deeper into one's own sense of embodiment in challenging and glorious ways. So I think I'll sort of stop there and uh, just open up a conversation um, with Jennifer and, and Scott. Um, I'd love to hear about, I mean, you've been working on this piece for several years, performing it in several states. Um, you opened last night here, you'll play four nights here. What is it like, what was it like last night? Where do you find yourself uh, in relation to a, a discourse that you are, are agitating, to use the word that's been uh, thrown around this, this day. So it, uh, what was it like last night? I think, yeah, in short. Yeah. Um, so uh, we came to Bard uh, and entered into an awareness of things that have been happening in the surrounding communities, adjacent communities, and on campus. And so, uh, and then realizing that we're in an institutional space, like educational space, um, 
where there's like community members who are coming to see the piece, but also students. Um, and we've been in this space before, uh, uh, and found that the the piece can be quite confusing if you're not if it's not being viewed with the set of assumptions that that we're that we make in making the piece. So personally, I had a lot of questions around how it was going to be received and. Uh, I had a lot of questions about rawness um, because we deploy such uh, stark action and such stark imagery. Um, so to have that sort of abrasive material rub up against a very like raw skin, um, I was like, oh no, is this cruel right now? Uh, but uh, we felt that the piece was received and seen with a lot of warmth and welcoming. Uh, if at the beginning, I felt in the room like there was a question about um, how to participate because it asks you to participate. Um, as I was watching Amelia, like the tail end of Emilio's work just now, I was like, oh, right. I'm really concerned with entertaining. And you had pointed out last night, Kenyon, when we spoke, that there's a danger ar around the way that we, we have decided to entertain the audience. There's a, there's a level of entertainment that this is not, uh, that this piece is striving for. And like, it could be as simply put as like, it's, it's comedic. And so that asks for a response. We're begging a response in the room in real time from people. And so there's a way that the, the way we ask for that complicity, because it's a kind of complicity with the audience could feel particularly dangerous or sort of wrong right now. And uh, I think that after that was mitigated by the audience, then we were able to play together, like us in the, in the room. Does that? Yeah, it's a very tough thing to, to wager <laughs> whether, <laughs> whether or not people will play. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> any, any thoughts? Us? I was just gonna say, I think the piece grapples with humor and and humor is maybe at the center of this. What are what are we allowed to laugh at? Is it is it healthy to laugh at things that are painful? What's the the line, um, or is there a line between tragedy and and comedy? And how do we kind of tightrope walk that in this particular piece? But I think the danger of I think we're using laughter in lots of different ways in this piece, and and there are different. Uh, there, there's a, a different flavor of laughter coming from the audience at different moments. And sometimes that laughter is about um, calming oneself and uh, depressurizing a situation. Laughter is used to kind of cut the tension and allow for, um, allow for, or allow for it to momentarily go away. And I think there are other moments where it's the laugh of I know, I, I understand. Um, and so I can laugh as a kind of conspicuous display of, of where I stand on a particular issue. Um, and I think that laughter can feel, um, can add to the rawness and we play with it quite dangerously because I think the laughs evolve over the course of the piece and hopefully the laugh begins to work on you in the audience um, to realize the different ways that it can be um, that it can cover up all of the, the things we're trying to have an honest discourse about. And when is it a tool to, to, a, to continue to perpetuate oppression and when is it a tool to um, make a connection and can we tell the difference? Um, but I think that, that it's, um, last night I think all of the laughter, all of those different kinds of laughter were happening in ways that felt um, constructive, but in the moment they can feel, I think, quite, um, quite scary and uh, like an assault sometimes. I, I, I have a question, and this is probably for both of you. Um, at least in, in my, I mean, I saw the play three or four, uh, when, when was it? Probably no? three years three ago. Three years ago, so uh, I'm hoping I remember everything. <laughs> uh, hopefully I'm not, because I'm going to see it again tomorrow. But, um, there's a journey that your character takes, at least in my memory, which ends up in a very raw and 
naked way. Um, and it's a, it's a way it really, in, in, at least as I understand Kenyans talking to me about the white imaginary, really does um, lay bare a certain uh, version of uh, a white imaginary of themselves and their relation racially. And I'm wondering um, if that was something, how you guys thought about that, and if that was something that was intentional, and, 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 and maybe both of your experiences of that journey that that character takes. I don't know how much to say about it. Um, mm -hmm. well, yeah, we thought we'd just, we thought we'd just, uh, just there's no spoiler alert. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think there's very much you could do to avoid surprise or <laughs> in this piece. Well, I mean, you know, in, in the end, you end up whipping yourself, correct? Uh, or not? There's a kind of, yeah, there's an, there's an act of uh, self-flagellation. Self-flagellation yeah. with a sexual component, yeah. too. Yeah. And I'm wondering what that act of self-flagellation as a racial, I mean, was that, was that an intentional idea, I assume? And how that became something you felt putting on the stage? And why was it important to do that? Well, there are, there are lots of layers to that moment um, that are a little tricky to unpack uh, for folks who have not seen the show. Um, I mean, we could talk about, um, so I think that when Scott was speaking about laughter, just if, let me, I just, just jumped oh, right go, on go, your go, thought. Go, go, go. Um, but when you were speaking about laughter, I was also hearing the word pleasure. So like, uh, and I think that we conflate those things, that laughter is meant to signify a, a kind of pleasure, and I don't think that it, it always does. And more often than not, perhaps it doesn't, actually. And I recently... Uh, came across like a sociological analysis of laughter, which is to say it occurs when the, uh, the laughing party feels safe. And it's meant to signify a safety. And I I'm not sure that I actually buy this, but I think about it a lot. Um, because I think that what can happen is that people will laugh not to signify their own safety, but to actually uh, signal the person who, ins who said or did something to incite the laughter that that person is safe. And so thinking about the mechanics of that, I think trouble a little bit the, the idea of like comedy and laughter uh, because we're really playing also with this pleasure and safety. And so this idea of pleasure, then we want to understand this self-flagellation. And so I think uh, where, uh, where it's, it's meant to, to exist within the context of our piece is not necessarily on either side of pleasure or pain, but actually really riding that, that center line. Um, and that as such, uh, there's a way that uh, Scott resting the, the, the whip, which is uh, its own object, um, to use it on himself as, I, as like my character has used it on his character, right, is another act of a kind of defiance. So there's a way that we're looking at who is administering this pleasure, this pain, mm -hmm. and then like the next moment, who is administering this pleasure, this pain? And all of these things are questions right. uh, that are meant to be active questions, like nothing that, that the piece wants to resolve, solve, or answer. Yeah, and I mean, I think in a, especially in a kind of subdom sexual Act there. The performance of those roles don't necessarily correspond to to the power that is in the room, and oftentimes the sub has the the power. And so, I think what's happening in that particular scene is the game, the the game that is being played within the game of the piece that is you know that, that ends up kind of becoming a, a Russian doll um, uh, of you know a Russian doll uh, structure of games within games, we're not sure who's setting the rules and who has the power at any given moment. And that's the delight of it, and that's the, the terror of it. Um, and yeah, I think there's something about that, there's something about that final act that is a reclamation of power by performing the most kind of obsequious acts that one can think of. 
That is certainly uh, part of the psychology of that character in that moment. Um, so how can I perform a kind of martyrdom and how does that performance of that martyrdom um, once again recenter my story in, in some way in that character's psyche in that moment, right? So it's this kind of like ultimate act of, of sacrifice, this Jesus level sacrifice that puts me like back at the pinnacle of the, of the narrative in a, in a kind of very aggressive um, hegemonic way. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So on this on this point of that particular scene, but also in general, the 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 choice really with this piece, with your work, with making the piece, to use the erotic space as a space to have the kind of discourses that we're trying to have throughout this conference. I mean, I, I imagine if uh, if Claudia Rankin's Citizen was an erotic thriller. You know, it would be it would be sort of in the space of what you're working with here, and um, you know, it's funny because we can sit in a very composed way and have weighty conversations, or we can go into the space that you've created and have erotic uh, conversations, addresses of memory that the play seems to assume we share, that we know what that laugh is, or we are wondering, should we be laughing? Um, can, you, can you just talk about what are the ideas that you yourselves are encountering um, as you take on what are these very daring conversations which, uh, if I were to, right now, start to try to delve into, it would be very, I'd be very hard pressed to express with the kind of clarity that, that you provide the, the audience. So what, what for you are the ideas that, that you're kind of encountering, putting forth, that led to this, this level, really, this, uh, hmm. of conversation? Right. <laughs> I think the conversation evolved over time. Uh, I, can, I can talk a little bit about how it started. Is, I feel like that could be a helpful thing. Yeah. I'll, I'll, do, I'll, I will, I'll do it. Which, so the story is based on a real situation. Uh, it, I actually grew up in Hanover, Pennsylvania, which is a place that is featured in the play. It's a small town uh, 15 miles east of Gettysburg in south central Pennsylvania. There was a skirmish on the, uh, just before the Battle of Gettysburg. Um, there's a big reenactment culture and a reenactment tourism around the Civil War, um, and there's a, a romanticism of that time period. Um, when I was in fifth grade in the Hanover Public School District, they created this thematic unit. Um, this is all kind of, well, you, you'll encounter this in the play as well. But in the fifth grade, they created, the, they, the teachers, created this thematic unit uh, for the Civil War that, uh, basically turned the entire uh, educational day into a, a live action role playing educational battle. So we would go to technical education class and carve out rifles from plywood and we all of the fifth graders were carrying like wooden rifles around the school and we had blue and gray t-shirts. We were you know, assigned uh, an army. We were Confederate soldiers or Union soldiers and we had these different contests and you would accrue points and the competitive game that was this uh, educational unit had all of the fifth graders, you know, playing this game and, and kind of, <laughs> you know, engaging in this in ways that they maybe had not throughout the whole year, which is really fascinating. Um, one of the games that the mostly white school created within this larger game was the Underground Railroad game, which um, was this game where uh, these dolls that were made to look like enslaved people, or some, someone's imagined idea of what enslaved people looked like, um, were carried around, transported around secretly by the Union soldiers, and then the Confederate soldiers had to uh, capture them. Um, and so I told this story to Jen when we were in grad school making theater, making original pieces of theater late one night. <laughs> and I remember you 
laughed and said something to the effect of, that's the most hilarious and horrifying thing I've ever heard. I said um, it was crazy. Yeah, you said it was crazy. That's right. Um, so as a kind of like jumping off place, that, that situation, which went on for many years uh, and only stopped at around 2006, 2007, um, seemed to carry within it a, a lot of information about how we educate people, how we tell stories about um, uh, the way in which different groups of people imagine other groups of people, uh, uh, racism, power. And so we kind of started using that game as a, as a, as a locus, as like a, a, a touchstone to come back to and kind of start to pull at the threads of what was kind of baked into that and the, the assumptions that were uh, baked into the idea to play that game and run it for many years. Um, and so that, yeah, I guess that's, that was kind of the, the place that kept feeding us this different source material. Obviously our play goes to far uh, darker and thornier places than a educational stage, and, uh, but, but in some ways that was the, the seed. And I think, so the game then exists as its own kind of reenactment practice. So there's this question around pedagogy. Do we have to thrust ourselves into the, the historical context in order for us to understand and then uh, break a cycle? So that's like one question that we had as we were making this piece. And then in thinking about uh, the, the, the dynamics of reenactment, uh, I, I have a lot of questions and um, critiques about that practice. And one uh, large one was the way that we narrativize history is often very, uh, there's something romantic about it all the time. Even when we're speaking about horrifying and horrific things, I find that the way those things get narrativized actually tends to point to a kind of fetishization of the moment. And so I'm like, well, it doesn't seem like we want to break this cycle because we actually rather enjoy that story. We rather enjoy the telling of it. We rather enjoy uh, getting ourselves back into it. So what if instead of, instead of valorizing ourselves for the disdain and, and hatred that we, and critique that we have of the past, what if we actually go to, what is the pleasure that we get out of recounting this and reliving it and like constantly propagating it? And so if we think about that, then another hypocrisy at the center of enslavement is, oh, okay, I see. So we're supposed to understand that back in the day, white people didn't think that non-white people were human. And so we're supposed to understand that as such, it made sense to enslave non-white people because they didn't think they were human. But if you don't think that a non-white person is human, why are you fucking that non-white person? And so like, then we get to this like central hypocrisy of, oh, well, what if we understand this actually in terms of erotics and desire and say, instead of telling the history as we would like it to be told, which is a everybody was separate and uh, people just didn't understand human dynamics. What if actually people did understand human dynamics and actually just did that anyway? And I think that that's uh, when we were working with the, if definitely us, well, two directors, um, the push was you're not actually being clear about uh, what you think this hypocrisy is. So like, I wanna know, like, what do you wanna skewer with this? Um, and so the, so, yeah, I think that's, that's the way we got to this romanticized histories, desire, erotics. Let's see how far we can push that and see what we can pull apart from it when we push it. So skewering a romantic history was sort of what you wanted to hit? Was that the... Yeah, I mean, and I, 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 you know, when I say that, I think that we're all complicit in that. Like, I'm not excusing myself uh, or, or you. <laughs> you know, I think that that's, uh, as we were talking last night about this idea of universality, there's a way that the, the, the piece rests on certain understandings, like I said, like certain ways that we're complicit. And so we can only tell this story if it's recognizable in some way. Right, so even if we're not articulating the way that we, that like this historical context or our complicity in it, 
Uh, the humor couldn't function unless we did, I think. Do you imagine this <laughs> as a Wait, why are people laughing? Because there's the humor again. <laughs> the humor, gets the last, uh, humor gets the last word, apparently. I'm just wondering if you imagine this, I mean, you, you said you, you had this idea, you had this idea and you had worked with directors to develop it. Was there a, I mean, was, is there a, do you imagine this as a political work or is it more of a work of entertainment? And I'm just wondering, because you, you know, you've talked a lot about laughter and joy, are they both? I mean, do you, how do you, is that something you think about when you're making a work like this? I just, I don't think that you can make work that's not political. I don't think, I don't think that that's possible. Even if you like make, oh. <laughs> uh, yeah, even if, there's, a, there's always a politics, even if you assert that your piece is apolitical, I'm like, well, that's your politics. You right. somehow think that yeah. you're outside of politics, which I think is, I don't think that's possible. Right. And, I, and I do think, uh, I do think that there is a, like we have an interest in entertainment. And then, yeah, like really thinking about the work that we all just saw in terms of that and what it is we're doing and asking of the audience when we do it. I don't think those two things are mutually exclusive. Uh, although, I, I, yeah, I suppose some people do. I, I think part of what uh, is interesting about that question vis-a-vis -vis this piece is that the piece is really um, examining and investigating modes of performance and uh, modes of performance vocabularies uh, and entertain, entertaining vocabularies. So, I mean, we're dealing with melodrama in a kind of like moonlit Spielberg, hazy world. And then we're also dealing with the romantic comedy of, you know, Sandra Bullock and somebody else. Uh, and like how we're charmed. And the different things that actually make that work and, tr and trigger us to respond in specific ways. And I think because we're trafficking in those modes only to um, uh, uh, pull, pull something away and, and point at it and to alienate you from your original understanding of what the conceit was is, is entertaining, is, is revealing that entertainment for the, for the, po the there's, politics that it might have. Yeah, there's a politics around the modality of, of each of the, the kind of fictions that we, or the devices that we deploy. So there's a politics around a Hollywoodization. There's a politics around romantic comedies. There's a politics around performing in an, a school assembly. There's a politics around minstrelsy. Um, there's, a, there's a politics around BDSM. One of the questions I, I came away with last year um, uh, at the conference uh, was just wondering about a sort of aspiration towards uh, a kind of white consciousness or conscious whiteness. Basically a question of is there such thing as a constructive whiteness which is harmful to no one and actually is part of a a future that we're, you know, the, the multiple futures we're trying to construct in the way that we talk about a black consciousness as being a creative consciousness, which is constructive and expansive. Um, I, I think what happens uh, in this work or in, in something that you are achieving in the space of the theater is a bit of a meeting of a halfway here. Maybe it's in the humor, uh, partly because the theater itself is constructed of a history of, of minstrelsy and uh, spectacle. Like all, all American theater is, is originated in blackface, and you know even everybody got their first job playing blackface, and then finally Mulroney, I assume, stopped using blackface in her own troupe. Um, so that, that there's a kind of shared space that is assumed, at, le at least with certain audiences, for this, and it'd be interesting to see it with completely different audiences. Um, but your your character, Scott, was saying things you don't hear very often, even from professors. I mean, you, the consciousness of your character, uh, conscious of both your characters, it was a mutuality. I'm interested in that mutual consciousness um, and how it became dramatically active, like how it became an action that you were both moving forward. Because can that be a metaphor for a way that discourse happens? Um, how did you achieve it? What is, the, what is it I'm seeing? What's the substance of it? What's that mutuality? And then what makes it active? Something you can toss back and forth, like a real game. Yeah, we talk about that 
the performance of those characters um, in masks, even though we're not really wearing a mask, we talk about just, and this is more from a kind of nuts and bolts, like how do we, how do we perform this scene um, uh, in terms of, of the kinds of masks we're wearing and how thick the mask is. So there are moments in the play where I think the mask is quite thin and we're playing pretty close to these two folks, but I don't think you can ever, well, that's an interesting question. Can you ever remove the mask entirely? But um, so I think there are moments where we're in some kind of agreement about the thickness of our masks and how uh, we often call the teachers, there are teachers in this play, we often call them like the idiots <laughs> or something at certain times. And then at other times we feel like they're quite, uh, their idiocy, idiocy is being applied to a kind of um, uh, self-examination and they're kind of witnessing for their community of students how we ought to be acting, and, and that takes us down these, this like rabbit hole of, of craziness and idiocy. So I don't know, I think there's a kind of, I think part of it is this complicity of knowing what mode we're in, and then that allows us to play uh, because we know, um, we know the version of the of the character that we're playing with in that moment. I think is part of it, um, and I think it shifts at different points throughout the show. So, like, if everybody's on board with laughing at the stupid thing that they say in scene one, where's everybody at in scene five? And is it? It seems to be far more divided. And some people are not. Some people are still laughing, and other people are asking, "Why are you laughing?" You know. Um, and I think that's very, we did that in a very deliberate, purposeful way. Um, and I think different people have a different experience of when they begin to feel like they're no longer, um, they're no longer understanding or they're no longer laughing or they're no longer safe or something, you know? I'd be curious to know when you say that uh, Scott's character articulates things that you don't often hear or haven't heard. Do you mean like very explicit? I'm wondering which moments you're thinking about. Right, right. So there's a lot of uh, racialized jokes and direct addresses between the characters. I'm not actually thinking about those things. There's a kind of clear eyedness mm -hmm. between the two characters. Um, you know, I think about, uh, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of quoting of Baldwin, but uh, here, here we go. Um, he talked about the, the kind of fallacy of, of segregation. And I kind of grew up having this sense, too. <laughs> you, you, you talk about segregation, but look, <laughs> look at my body. Uh, look, you know, my, obviously, people are not living completely separately. Um, the, uh, it, the erotic space alone is, is a proof of that. Um, I think a lot of people in this country, especially black people, know about the proximities. Um, and I think it's the same thing now. If you talk to Latinx communities and families, or just walk around Brooklyn, you see who's raising whose children, and you're just like, you're talking about being separate. You're talking about being, having no understanding of one another, and yet people are raising your children. You have a sex with people. You got, you know, you're sharing children for generations. There's a clear eyedness between the two uh, characters or players, I'm not sure, but there's some kind of like, we know what we're doing, we know what we're holding. And to me, that has something, says something about you, uh, memory and, and racial uh, identities or, or memory about race. And so as we try to talk about racism, um, the idea of whose knowledge is on the line, uh, well, I have nothing to say, about, or <laughs> who's the expert here, um, you're equally holding the memory as a thing. And I don't experience that in, uh, very frequently uh, in, in multiple circles. I mean, where there's a, a sense of, yeah, we all know what's going on in the bodied life because you've brought it to the sort of erotic space. Does this make sense for how you're thinking about the relationships of the characters and the subjects you're sort of throwing on the stage? Yeah, I'm just, I'm like slowly nodding because I'm like, oh, I never thought about it that way before, I think. That's like maybe a mechanic of the way we write, which is through improving. So like oh, we're thinking about these characters and like who are these, 
like what is what is this thing like what is fun about this thing and i think oftentimes what's most fun to play is a kind of like paradoxical human like really giving life to these paradoxes um it's it's fun because you're not landing on one side of something you're actually getting to explore like i can't believe that both of these things can live in this body and maybe that's what you're responding to. I can't, believe, I can't believe that they're actually allowing both of these things to live in these bodies and performing it instead of announcing that this, is, this person is like this. Yeah, here's the jurisdiction here. Like that is, it's a shared jurisdiction. And I think that is a, I don't know if it's like an honest conversation. I'm just saying that that is like a very immediate conversation and you don't get that space very often. I think, I mean, another way to put it too is like it was written as it was being performed. Like we were, we were writing it into the performance. It's not like this was written by somebody else. The two other people are like, hi, nice to meet you. We have three weeks to put on this play together. Every, every step and every scene was an, an agreement or a fight <laughs> about what would happen on that stage. And that, and that you know, the, the like blood, sweat, and tears of that is like, is, is what made the show. I mean, I even think there's, there's a scene in the show, we were talking about this last night in front of the tent, where there's a kind of moment of, I think you're often asking, where am I in this show? But I think you're asking if that particular moment is a real, where are we right now in, in space and time? Um, are we here in you know, Bard College? Um, I think is maybe a question I would be asking about that space. But it comes from a, a really hard conversation we actually had in the rehearsal room. So by bringing the question of authorship and by bringing, bringing these questions we were having in the actual rehearsal space and, and finding a way to, to dramatize them allowed for the piece to achieve a, a kind of honesty, I think, that it achieves in other parts, but um, in that moment that I f there's a kind of authenticity, I hope, that is being, you know, given out to everybody else. Are there, I don't know how many of you have seen the play, but there's a question here. Is there a mic we can have? So to begin with, I had the great fortune of actually seeing this performance last night, uh, which will re remain a highlight for me of this conference forever. I just want to get that said. Um, I don't, I have no idea what this con how this conversation that you've just had falls on those people who were not there and who have not seen this, this play. Because it's, I mean, I I, I'm sure I experienced something different in this conversation than they did. So uh, that, that being said, I just wanted to say something about audience and the audience's reaction, because I was audience. So I'd like you to know that, because um, you may know this already for, because you've done it before, the, first of all, the arbitrary selection of sides for, in the game fell, made some people feel very uncomfortable. Not so much because of, they were, they were, because of what was happening, but because of the side that they had been selected for. So, uh, which I thought was kind of interesting. That is, people had already taken sides in the outcome of the Civil War, right? And didn't want to be on the wrong side of history. I think there was a certain amount of discomfort for the audience when they discovered that they were going to be part of the performance. And you may have detected that from the stage. In fact, I, I, you could have not, have not have detected that from the stage. And, but that discomfort gradually disappeared after it became apparent that they weren't going to really be part of the performance, that it was just a kind of like an opening gambit. And it, it, this, this occurs to you gradually as, when, you're seated, when you're seated in the audience. At a certain point, you just surrender to the play and realize that, OK, they're not going to call on me again. They're not going to ask me to turn around, so on and so forth. And that's, I think that's very important because I think if the audience had been called upon to participate continually in the game, it might have been much more uncomfortable and much less 
there would have been less laughter. And finally, I want to say that there were some people uh, that I had a chance to talk to afterward who were uncomfortable with the, uh, the onstage eroticism. Yeah. And, uh, and quite understandably, I mean, some people uh, do not go to the theater expecting to see that, although one of the people who was in the group that I was talking to was European, he came from Switzerland, he said, well, in Europe we see this all the time. This happens in Europe on the stage all the time. But it was an opportunity really to talk about an understanding the, the connection between, or the, the fundamental connection of eroticism to both slavery and racism generally. That um, the role of, of, the, of desire and of, and of um, uh, the role of rape in, in, in the, uh, in the, in the uh, history of slavery, not very often talked about. People who talk about slavery talk about you know, how badly people were treated and free labor and all of that, and very seldom about the extensive rape and, and its consequences in the, in the modern day. Sorry. So that was, that was something that was new to, to, to these people. And they said, you know, we never thought about that before. And I said, yes, and this play, we would never have talked about it but for this play. Yeah. So I want, I want to thank you for that contribution because I, I don't know how many other people walked out thinking about that, but you really brought that home in a way that a, 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 a book, a, you know, a, 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 an article in a newspaper or magazine would not have. It was very visceral and very real. So thank you for that. Thank you. So, so maybe two questions you can respond to is one, how, how, how willing were you to, how, how much did you think about how far you could push people to participate in this play? Um, you know, there's the, as he said, there was this moment of fear and then relief. Maybe that's also the erotics. Um, but I'm wondering, did you think about pushing people more to, partic to participate more and, and how far could you? And then the second question he said, you know, I think is a good question of, um, you know, we've, we've talked about it a bit, but, um, you know, uh, I guess what it, where do the, where do the erotics in this play, um, is it, it, it's not just a shock, right? You're trying to do something with it. Um, uh, what are, you know, what, what, what do you want the erotics to do in the play? Uh, in addition, and how does that impact the, the audience experience? So maybe those are the two questions I took from that. You guys can hear what he said as well. Uh, maybe you can both respond. Well, we did um, talk about audience participation a lot uh, in the making of this piece. Uh, you know, we do cast the audience um, and we recast the audience, I think, several times in this play. And there was something powerful about uh, casting them, casting you, and uh, but not asking too much uh, from that person. They're kind of completing the circuit, I would say, um, kind of completing a performative circuit and a psychological circuit, but that doesn't, um, that doesn't necessarily include someone like having to get up on stage or being kind of called out in a, in a kind of classic, uh, I need a, I need a volunteer kind of a, a potentially embarrassing way, um, but we did we did play with that. We did try that. Uh, it was very much guess and check, and, and I mean, so much of this piece was made in the room with bodies in space first, not not words on page first, um, and part of that is not having any idea how things would work until we had the third. Uh, cast member in the room, which was you. Uh, and we tried lots of things that failed uh, <laughs> pretty impressively early on. Um, and we realized we had to kind of, that, that line is something that was, um, we came to an agreement upon as we, as we, through discovery. How far can we push this? How, if we push it that far, where do laughs need to go, or, or what, what kind, if a laugh is here, um, does that change where we get to over here? So the level of nudity and the level of audience engagement, all of that 
evolved over time as we kind of started to feel our way through the dark of how um, different audiences would handle it. Um, and so I guess I'll just say like what we, what we discovered is um, built up based off of this kind of, um, this information that we gathered from you all over many, many years. Uh, what was the second question? Well, I mean, he was, he was, the question was about the place and the importance of portraying and thinking about um, rape and um, oh, right. uh, erotics in, in, in the story of slavery. Yeah, so uh, I think we were thinking more about um, questions around consent, and I use the word questions like really intentionally. Um, that if we start uh, trying to confuse the, the vectors of power that we uh, teach ourselves are at play when we look at enslavement, um, so that we can start to have a different understanding of agency uh, as well as oppression. So like there's a way that I somehow, um, like oppression is such a bedrock of the construction of the white savior and I think that that's one of the things that's on the um you know on the firing firing squad or whatever like that's one of the things that we're trying to debunk um that uh with with this piece you know when we teach about enslavement uh, in the very next breath, we want to start talking about the Underground Railroad. In the very next breath, breath we want to start talking about abolitionism. And so, uh, one of something then that needs to be covered is like, well, what is oppression? Um, but so then we don't have these conversations about resistance, right? Or we we want to understand. Um, resistance like in, in terms of, of whiteness and like that kind of valorization. Like, um, so then if we start questioning what agency means and what consent means, and then like we, we talked a lot about the master-slave dichotomy. So this moment at the end when Scott's character takes the, the whip and starts whipping himself, like then we start to also get to this question about who, who is doing what to whom um, and so that's why I think this space of uh, questioning consent is important um, because I don't actually, uh, and we had, we had questions about whether or not to, to yeah, to, to fully go deeper into r rape and the piece intentionally does not do that. Um, because of the need to keep these questions afloat uh, and not be so clear. And it's funny, it's a funny observation to say we don't often consider enslavement in terms of rape because I'm like, that's like one of the primary things that I, that I think about and, and, you know, like was taught to me in learning about this moment. And so I think uh, there's some information there that this take could be, rad could be radical um, and the ways in which it isn't. Uh, you said there's something in the, uh, maybe it's the penultimate moment of the play, it's actually after that really intense committed uh, moment for any performer to, to give, which Scott delivers um, with a, a lot of commitment and training. Um, and then following that, there, there's a line that says, is this what we want? Is this what we wanted? And I just love that question. That's something that I was trying to get at, at the sharedness and the mutuality. Very rarely do you experience mutuality <laughs> in general. Usually it leads to a celebration. A parade is a way of experiencing mutuality. But you notice how quickly a parade can become a spectacle. That is a very fine line. And I feel like you really, um, in a moment like that, where all of us are in a, in a kind of horror, and you say, is this what we wanted? And then I start to think about desire in colonialism and desire in the, the colonial postures and attitudes that see themselves as uh, universal, but then everything else is particular and, de and delightful. <laughs> I want to put it in my pocket to possess it. Um, 
And so the question, is that what we wanted? And the, the, the we-ness of it, um, and the, 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 the mutuality in, in asking of it, the, the permission to ask it, is something so rare in, in discussions that are large discussions about large histories, long-standing violences, to, to, to say that somewhere in here, someone wanted something. And it makes me say, well, you know, we're all gathered here. We took time out of our schedules away from our families, et cetera, away from partners and, you know, there's childcare dollars happening all over the place here. Is what, what do we want? What do we want? What is at bottom? And uh, to me, that's what's at stake, maybe in this piece, but certainly in this conference. How do you navigate desire as a through line of this, of this work, even the impetus to make a work like this? And what do we want? Did that question have a, in your mind, I mean, was that a question that you left it with? Is that what we want? Wanted. Well, in the uh, play, she responds, I'm not sure. Yeah, but I think um, it's a necessarily and like intentionally open question. Um, that it is a question. And then um, the use of the word that. Because uh, in that case, in that moment, you know, ostensibly it, it's meant to refer to the, the, the thing that just happened, but also is meant to refer to the whole, the whole game, the, like all of the, the nesting dolls of games within games within games, and this question of competition in general, that like, uh, I think embedded in that question is like, what do we get out of this competition? What do we get out of playing this with and at each other? And is the end actually what we wanted when we set out to do this? Yeah, I think another layer on that moment and the that, uh, of, that of that sentence is a question about satire and the, the power of satire. Is that the moment where the satire actually has payoff, has real true payoff? Or is that the moment where the satire has crumbled and, and um, is no longer achieving its stated outcome. Uh, and I think, I'm not sure, <laughs> but uh, certainly one of those could be happening at that moment, I mean, or one of those and both are happening kind of at the same time, maybe. Great. Um, we're, we're out of time. Do you, any, is there any final comments? Any of you need, feel like you want to add? We're going to um, take a break, uh, about half an hour, and we're going to come back at uh, 5 o'clock for the last two panels. Uh, I really encourage you to come back. Please join me in thanking Scott, Jennifer, and Kenyon. <laughs>